We stopped in the middle last week, and it will continue now as we look at things related to heaven. And it's, we have all eternity ahead of us to rest. You know, we get tired. You know? Some days we just, you don't really seem to be doing a lot, but you get tired. You need rest. And not the least of the riches of heaven will be the satisfaction of those wants of the soul. The things that we seek, the things that we want. Oh, it's right in the middle of my eye. You know, the things that we've, we've sought for down here and we've never found. You know, like knowledge, perfect peace, satisfying love. Those things will be there that we don't have now. You know, like a beautiful likeness that's been marred and it's uh, dabbed over with, you know, this world streaks of black and it's going to be restored to its original beauty. You know, the soul is going to be restored to its original beauty when we are washed with the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, the senseless images on canvas can't be compared to any, any other way that, to a living, rational soul. You know, we look at a painting and of landscape and it might be beautiful, but it does, it's not as beautiful as looking at God's creation. And one day our, our soul is going to be what it should be for Him. If we could see some of our friends who have gone on before us, you know, we might feel like if we would see them right now, if we would see them as they are in heaven, we might have the inclination to fall down and worship them because they'd be so different. But, you know, the Apostle John, for example, saw a lot of strange things when he received the revelation from Jesus Christ. He saw angels and secrets of heaven revealed to him. And one angel came before him and we read in the last chapter of Revelation, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. But when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am a fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. My point here is if we would see a loved one who's gone on to heaven, and we would see what they are now, we would be like John because they would be so much elevated above what we are in this world. You know, the diamond as we know it today, and the diamond's valuable, isn't it? You know, the diamond, re re you know, the polished diamond, you know, it reflects no light, does it? Not only its own light, but a little sun shining in the light of its own. When you hold it, you look at that diamond in the dark, nothing happens. But you get a little light onto it and it begins to show something. That polished diamond of the soul reflects the beauty and the light of God and preserves its own personality as well. You know, right now, our souls aren't so pretty, are they? Even though we're, we're saved, we're washed clean by the blood, it's not pretty yet but it's going to be. Among the wants which we have on this earth is the thirst for knowledge. You know, how many times have I told you there's only about a million things that I would like to ask the Lord when I get to heaven just about His Word. We want to learn things. We want to know things. But you know, sin has weakened our mental faculties. We don't always think about that, how sin has an effect on us. Sin is why you have the diseases in the world. Sin is why there's corruption out there. Sin is why we don't think with 100% of our mind. It's changed us. But it hasn't taken away any of our not desire for knowledge. And we want, one of the things we should want is to know more about the Lord. But with all of His efforts, with all that He thinks and all that He you know, knows about astronomy and chemistry and all kinds of science and those types of things, his knowledge of the secrets of nature is limited. I mean, very limited. We really, when you look at it, it's hard to understand, isn't it? Yeah. 
Did your, your mom ever ask you, you growing up, just how she picking at you? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first? The chicken. The Ideopolis, God created that. But when you think about how God put things in order, how things work, you take a little dead seed, you plant it in the ground, you grow something. And we don't understand all of that. There are many things that we do not know. And you know, the older I get, the more I realize the number of things I don't know. Even the Bible, the more you study, the one thing you're going to learn, you don't know anything. Because the more you study, the more you realize that. You know, there have been thousands of astron astron astronomers who have looked into the heavens and they've studied and oh, as the times roll by and they, somewhere they said, well, that planet has two moons around it. They have taken them a thousand years to figure that out. And perhaps though in in the near future, I said, well, they're not moons at all. They're other stars. You know, our human knowledge really doesn't amount to much. When we put our knowledge compared to God's knowledge, we don't know much. But maybe we will. There's not one of our college professors, and many of them have gone just about everywhere in the world that you can possibly go, but they're anxious to learn more and more. They want to find new things to make new discoveries. If we were familiar with all the stars in the firmament as we are with our own earth, we still wouldn't be satisfied. People travel all over the world, see all these scenes, great sceneries and sights and wonders, and they're still not satisfied. And not until we are like Christ are we going to be able to comprehend the infinite. Even the imperfect glimpses of God that we may get by faith only intensifies <coughs> our desires for more. You know, for now, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now we see through the glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now, the word that Paul uses here could easily be translated for us to understand mirror. Now I look through the mirror. You know, now we see God's face as if we're looking through a looking glass. I had a looking glass, and, but then we're going to see him face to face. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Suppose we knew nothing of the sun except what we saw, the reflection of the moon. You know, we see it reflected at night. We had the full moon, I think it was last week. Wasn't it pretty? That's the sun reflecting off of that. But what if that was all that we knew about the sun? Would we wonder about the distance it is away from us? We wonder about that splendor that it displays or about the life that it gives? Now, all that we see, the sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean, the earth, the flowers, and above all, man, are a grand mirror in which the perfection of God is imperfectly reflect, reflected. Another, you know, another want that we have in this world, as I mentioned earlier, is rest. We get tired of toiling. We just get tired. We get physically tired. We get emotionally tired. We get spiritually tired. There is no rest on earth. We find in Hebrews 4.9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he, hath, he that is entered into his rest, he has also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Interesting passage because it tells us if we want to have rest, we have to work while we're here. Now, while we all want rest, I think a great many people make the mistake of thinking that church is a place of rest. When they unite with the church, become part of a church family, they have the false idea about their position in it. There are a great many 
who come into the church to rest. But the text that I just read said, there remaineth, remaineth a rest for the people of God. But it does not tell us that the church is that place of rest. We have all eternity to rest in. We are to rest by and by. That's what we heard the old hymn there. But we are to work here. And when our work is finished, the Lord will call us home and there we will enjoy rest. There's no use talking about rest down here because we're in enemy territory. You cannot rest when you're in enemy territory. You have to be on guard all the time. We cannot rest in this world where God's Son has been crucified and cast out. I think a great many people are going to lose their reward because they have just come to the church with the idea that they can come into the church and rest as if the church was working for reward instead of each one building over against his own house, each one using his influence toward the, the building up of Christ's kingdom. They just want to rest. In Revelation 14, 13, we read, this is John said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. You see here again, you want to rest, you work now. The rest comes. You know, death is going to come. If the Lord doesn't come back in our lifetime, it's going to come. And it's going to rob us of our money. But you know what? You're not going to need money anymore anyway. There are no banks in heaven. No 7-Elevens that you run in. No, we don't need that money. Death may rob you of your position. So what? Big deal, right? Death may rob us of our friends, but there's one thing that death can never do, and that is rob us of the work that we have performed for Him. That work will live on. It says their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. How much are we working? Whew, what is a question that hurts, doesn't it? How much are we working? How much are we doing? Anything that we do outside of ourselves, anything that's not for the cause of Christ, ooh, that's bad. It can't be with a mean or selfish spirit. That is not going to live. If you're doing it for your own purposes, you're doing it with the wrong spirit, those works are not going to live after you. We have the privilege of setting in motion strings of activity that will flow on when we are dead and gone. It's a privilege of every believer to live more in the future than they do in the present so that their lives will tell, that, tell something special about them in 50 or 100 years of what they did for the Lord. You know, John Wesley, his influence is felt today probably a thousand times greater than when he was living. His works live on. He lives in thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of his spiritual descendants. Martin Luther, even though I don't agree with all of his theology, he, he is probably more known today than when he awakened Germany to the truth. He only lived one life, and that was for a little while, but now look at the hundreds and thousands of people who are still learning because of what he said, what he did. There are 50 or 60 million people who profess to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who were taught by him. They bear his name. You know, he's dead in the sight of the world, but his works do follow him. His works live on. The voice of John the Baptist is still ringing in the world today, 2,000 years after he passed away, since Herodias said, give me his head on a silver platter. Herod thought when he beheaded John, that would hush his voice. But you know what? His voice is still ringing through the world today, 2,000 years later. John the Baptist lives 
today. Not physically, but because he lived for God and he has entered into his rest and his works do follow him. His works are still here today. And if people up in heaven knew what we're going, know what's going on down here on the earth, how much joy must they have to think that they have set those things in motion? That their work is going on after them and after them. And that's why, look at the, you know, when you open your Bible and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke, Acts, Luke wrote that, or the Pauline epistles, or they still, their works are still living today. They're at rest, but their works are still here. If a man leave, lives a mean, selfish life, he goes down to the grave and his name and everything concerning him goes right down to that grave with him. If he's ambitious to leave a record behind with a selfish motive, his name rots with his body. If a man gets outside of himself though and begins to work for the Lord, his name will live on. You know, if you would go to Scotland today, it'd be a nice place to go, I think, but I'm not going. But if you went to Scotland today, you would see that the influence of John Knox is everywhere in that country. It seems, they said, you seems you almost feel his breath in the highlands today. His influence still lives. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Blessed is the rest that is in store for the believer who works for the Lord. We will rest in God's time, but we shouldn't waste time talking about rest while we're down here. If I'm going to wipe a tear off somebody's cheek, maybe someone at a funeral just lost a father, I have to do that down here. It's not said in Scripture that we're going to have the privilege of doing that hereafter. Any tears will be wiped away. God's going to do it. If I'm going to help a, a fallen man who has been overtaken by sin, I have to do it here. We're not going to have the privilege of being co-workers with God in the future, but it is our privilege today. We may not have it tomorrow. It may be taken from us tomorrow. But we can enter into the vineyard and do some work today before the sun goes down. We can do something now before we get to glory. Another want that we feel here is love. Heaven is the only place where conditions of love can be totally fulfilled. Their, you know, their love is essentially mutual. Everybody loves everybody else. Christians, you better start to love one another now because you're going to be with each other for a long time. You know, in this world of wickedness and sin, it seems impossible for people to be, a, to be all on perfect to be equ you know, equality. When we meet people who are bright and beautiful and good, we have no difficulty in loving them, do we? A lot of times people make up their mind where they're going to like or love somebody just by the way someone looks. All people in heaven, though, are going to be like that. As Earl Clemens said, going to be more pretty when I get to heaven than I am now. But we're going to love each other. There will be no fear of misplaced confidences there. There shall never be anyone deceived by those we love there. When suspicion of doubt comes about and it faces upon anyone who loves, their happiness from that moment on is at an end. There's going to be suspicion here. But in heaven there is no suspicion. And I think what I'm going to do, because I'm getting ready to get into a new section, I will just stop short this evening.